Good morning. I'm Dr. Steve Stice, Chief Medical Officer here at the University of Kansas Health System and Executive Vice Chancellor of the University of Kansas Medical Center. Welcome back to Open Mics with Dr. Stites. A lot of people have battled a weight problem for years. Often the extra pounds lead to other conditions such as diabetes. And research published in the Journal of the American Medical Association is comparing the two main treatment paths for those who are living with obesity and diabetes. The study pulled data from four different randomized controlled trials looking at several hundred people with type 2 diabetes. And its key question was, what's better at getting their glucose under control, bariatric surgery or medical and lifestyle management? According to this study, bariatric surgery achieved much better long-term control of blood sugars compared to people who only received medical management and lifestyle interventions. But before we explore the pros and cons, we're gonna do a little morning rounds today. Some important developments around Hurricane Helene. We've all been watching new reports about the devastation from that hurricane as death and damage tolls rise. Now you can add hospitals everywhere, including our health system among the storm's victims as healthcare wrestles with a dis disruption in the IV fluid supply chain. One company, Baxter International so makes 60% of the nation's IV fluids, which are critical to healthcare. Guys, that's, I understand, that's a lot of fluid for us, and we use a lot of fluid all the time. Now, the American Hospital Association is asking the White House to declare a national emergency for all the reasons we're going to talk about right now. Dr. Tim Williamson is the Physician Vice President of Quality and Safety. He's been involved with us on issues around resource management throughout COVID and right now. In fact, just as a thought, Tim, you know, we never had a problem with resource management until you came along. So <laughs> are you the problem? Is. Clearly. That, it's not Clearly. Helene, it's Williamson. Is that, that Clearly. Be, I should just go back and be just a doctor again. I want to, you know, but I thought. No, just kidding. But, so IV fluids are so commonly used throughout the healthcare industry, including home healthcare applications, including like, when you go to get an IV therapy outside of the hospital. But what makes this supply chain issue so different for us? Why are not only this hospital, but all hospitals so vulnerable? Yeah, I think it's the breadth and depth, and it, it goes very far and wide because we use IV fluids everywhere. We use them inpatient, ambulatory, in the emergency department, surgical center. So we use them on virtually every healthcare setting uh, that we're in. Now, we thought about it. if you're in the hospital often you can't eat you can't drink you're sick your body needs a lot more fluids we use IV fluids routinely to help keep people's vital organs actually their own physical health stable this is a really big shortage folks and, and I think that one of the challenges is that you've heard us describe about shortages all along because they were true this one is perhaps the most profound of all. Now, we've navigated at least three other big supply chain issues that I mentioned using ways to mitigate that. But, Tim, what can we do to help with that now? Yeah, so this one is different again <coughs> because this is so much broader than those other uh, supply chain shortages we've had, and we had no forewarning. Um, we know that we can't go out and get more IV fluids and the other products that are affected because with 60% of the market being affected, those other 40% are also impacted because of the that need to, to bulk up our supplies. So we're looking, we have groups working all across the health system trying to figure out where can we conserve fluids. So some of that is starting with um, oral fluids wh whenever we can, if you can keep fluids down, that's gonna be a preference. Some of that is we've used IV fluids just because, so when we maybe absolutely didn't need them, but they were there and hung and used in case. It was a luxury more than a requirement. And you know, I've been saying that, we've, we've become very complacent. We took for granted that IV fluids were just like water. It would just always be there. And so we ha there is a lot of efficiencies we can gain by not setting stuff up when we're not gonna use it. Um, and those are the types of things that we're looking at. We can give you medicine in, by mouth instead of in an IV bag, we're gonna do that and a whole bunch of other, other things that we're looking at. What have we been doing just because that's the way we've always done it and it's not critical that you have the IV fluids <clears throat> in that setting. So some places have started to cancel elective surgery like up in the Twin Cities amongst others because we didn't want to have to put those fluids, put the patients at risk or not have enough fluid. 
We've not done that yet. How come? We haven't, but in, in full transparency, we're looking at what the timing of that would be and what that would look like. You know, we did that uh, during uh, the beginning of COVID, and that has a horrendous impact on patients. And so we want to avoid that as, as, as long as possible. But this may impact certain surgeries that if they're truly elective, we may have to figure out which ones can be pushed back depending on how much fluid needs to be used. We'd much rather use less fluid and even in those surgeries, but we're looking at, and there may come a time where us and others in the metro area, so this is not just us, and I want to underscore that, but that us and others in the metro area may need to, to do that. And of course we don't want to. So Dr. Williams, one of the challenges is we can't make this on our own. You know, it seems like simple. It takes a little salt, take a little water, you mix it together, give it to somebody. It's not that easy. It is not that easy. And a lot of people, I did look up how to make um, saline in your basement just for fun. Well, um, that that's gives me great confidence. Well, I, that's not our pathway. Um, but no, it, you know, I've been asked multiple times, can we just make it? It's salt and it's water. But there's shortages of um, IV bags, for, sterile bags, for example. So there's so many downstream impacts and, and um, no easy answers. We're going to have to get there largely by conserving the fluid that we use. Uh, and being really uh, creative. And, and this, quite, quite frankly, may last months uh, before we It's recommended, it, it, the that. thought is Baxter was like four to six months to get this thing back up and going again. They had leaks inside their mm -hmm. labs, had leaks inside the production fa facilities from the hurricane. And the challenge is to win a sterility. You know, we could probably find some old glass jars and put the stopcocks on because when we, you and I were, well, maybe not you, but when I first started <laughs> medicine, we still had a lot of those hanging. But, um, and you could reuse them. But you can't do that in a sterile fashion. And that, that, it, the sterility so you don't get an infection introduced to an IV is a really darn big deal. Yeah. So right now, patients going to notice any change? Um, right now, no, other than they might be uh, asked to drink fluids instead of getting an IV when they might have done that with a similar procedure or presentation before. Uh, so right now, you're not going to walk in the door and notice a big difference. Uh, but as we progress with this, uh, some of those things may change. All right, so we may have to reduce our fluid usage by 50% or so. That's a lot. Yep. So, uh, so buckle in. All right, well, thank you, sir. Appreciate the great work you're doing about that. I know there's a whole team of people trying to oh, analyze so many, this. So many people. And uh, thanks for coming up and being that spokesperson. All right, thanks for having me. All right, with us is Dr. Um, bariatric surgeon, Dr. Jennifer McAllister from the University of Kansas Health System, who's going to help explain the process of weight loss surgery and what you need to know if you are considering it. Also joining us is one of the patients from that, sur that surgical program, Lachey Haynes. I said, pretty close, right? I'm pretty close? That's correct. Awesome. Who is going to share her experience with diabetes and with the surgery. And Dr. John Tifo. John is director of the KU Diabetes, Diabetes Institute and co-principal investigator of KC Moore, the Kansas City Center for Metabolism and obesity research. Thanks everybody for being here this morning. Appreciate having you. Morning. All right, Dr. Tifa, Dr. McAllister, the conclusion of this study was that bariatric surgery outperforms lifestyle medical management when it comes to managing type two diabetes. Is that a widely accepted conclusion? Does this study change how we compare those treatments or a lot? Well, I'm not surprised. I think it's, it's pretty clear that the degree of weight loss and um, the maintenance of the weight loss is far better with bariatric surgery. Um, and so it has a more profound effect on glycemic control with, in diabetes. But I also wanna say that a lot of times our lifestyle interventions for people with diabetes through clinical care are not that robust either. Um, they a lot of times just focus on a few meetings with an RD, not a lot of physical activity, dietitian, dietitian, dietitian. Yep. not a lot of physical activity, exercise information. So I think we could do better there, but I'm not surprised that the surgery is more effective. Yeah, and I would have to agree. You know, we've known for years that bariatric surgery is effective for weight loss, and, and this study adds to our knowledge that it's a very effective treatment for diabetes, and not only diabetes, but also high cholesterol, hypertension, sleep apnea, risk factors for cardiovascular disease, and also decreases the incidence of cancer in post-bariatric patients. And so what we really need to call these are metabolic operations and not specifically weight loss operations. Yeah, that makes better sense to me. Now, just to clarify, the study we're talking about is focused on type 2 diabetes. 
Um, Dr. Tifo, could bariatric surgery help people who have type 1 diabetes as well? Well, historically, people with type 1 diabetes don't have obesity. Right. They, they, they would actually be underweight, but there is now um, data, especially in adolescents with type 1, that they have obesity rates on par with, with, health, with you know, non-diabetic kids and maybe even higher. So maybe it's something, something we explore someday, but right now I, I don't see that as a, as, as a treatment for type 1 diabetes. So lots of stuff about the GLP-1 agonists like um, Zepbound or Ozempic and things like that. Were those drugs on that in this study? Um, I don't think they included those as a part of the lifestyle. I don't, I don't management. think they did, right? This, uh, that yeah. was my question. You look at the study, like, well, wait a minute, they don't really include the GLP 1 agonist. So, would GLP 1 agonist have given us a different story? And again, that's Zepbound and Ozempic and, yeah. and all that. But a lot of, remember that the GLP 1 agonist first came out for improving glycemia. So, a lot of it, diabetes patients are already on these drugs right. and they have weight, their, their weight maintained on those drugs. So. Um, if they were on them, they were probably on a, a, a dose that was um, causing weight maintenance. Okay. Right, and it's fascinating to remember that these are fairly new medications, especially indicated for both diabetes, but then mm -hmm. separate indications for weight loss. And you know, with the bariatric operations, for years we didn't quite understand the mechanism of how they worked. You know, we'd say we make the stomach smaller, you can't eat as much, we bypass part of the small intestine that would have absorbed those calories. And, and what we now know is that, you know, it's a fascinating mix of how our body feeds back to control our hunger. And so what we know with the bariatric operations is that we see a natural increase in our body's own GLP-1 after surgery. With food entering the small intestine more rapidly, we have what's called enhanced nutrient sensing that increases our body's GLP-1. But then there's also multiple other hormonal changes too. And so it's it's all of those changes that we now understand much more thoroughly that really sees the enhanced benefits from bariatric surgery. It's, it's, it, you know, the gut does have a mind of its own. And uh, mm -hmm. we, we talked about that in one of these programs in the past. So. Can surgery actually eliminate a patient's need for diabetic medication by just bringing in or good control, do you think? Is that a possibility? Oh yeah, there's high rates of resolution of diabetes after bariatric surgery, and that's been known for several years. So what are some of the risk factors of bariatric surgery, Dr. McAllister? Well, these are safe and effective operations. They're now done in a minimally invasive format where patients usually stay one night in the hospital, sometimes less than that even. But all surgical procedures have risk. What we know large scale is that these operations are safer than having a knee or hip replacement, almost as safe as having your appendix out. Um, okay. There's risk of infections, post-op recovery, ambulation and movement is key. That's part of overall success, but decreasing any risk factors after surgery as well. All right, well, let's talk with one of your patients. Lachey, welcome and thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you. Thanks for coming up and telling your story on this program. Now, you are thank gracious you. enough to share some of your photos both before and after your bari bariatric surgery in Good. June of last year, so 2023. Correct. So, first of all, that's a pretty remarkable change of those two photographs, Thank right? Thank you. So um, I was taught, okay, man, I always thought you never ask a lady of their age, you never <laughs> ask people if they're pregnant, man, and I, I, I have had enough foibles around that in my Correct. life and stepped into it and, and done stupid things. So I won't, I'm, I'm not going to do that, but if you volunteered it, that'd be okay. Um, well, how old are you? <laughs> I, was, um, I was 377 pounds okay. when I started um, out with the weight loss surgery. Now I'm down to 188. Holy cow, that's a lot. Congratulations, well done. Thank I'd you. I'd say let's go Royals, but that's a let's go Chalice, I think, right Thank there. Thank you. So 200 pounds, 15 months, holy moly, what's your goal? My goal was 200. All right, so you're at it. goal. That's awesome. Now, first of all, has that completely changed your life? Tremendously. Talk to us about that. Well, the reason why I say it changed my life, it, it changed my day-to-day -day activity. Um, when I did have the weight on, I couldn't get it around. Um, it was hard to get out of bed. I had a little trouble breathing. Um, I was taking like 20 to 30 pills for diabetes, um, GERD, acid reflux. Um, I was taking insulin. Um, I was pricking my finger every day. Um, um, I was in and out the hospital due to my diabetes, my blood pressure, wow. this, this, a lot of stuff. I'm guessing all that made you realize time to try and get rid of this weight. Yes, sir. How'd you find Dr. McAllister in a weight loss? Team? Well, um, I was employed at Truman Medical Center and um, I was like, uh, something has to change. Uh, my mama had um, kidney failure. Mm -hmm. She had diabetes. 
um, and I took care of her for 10 years, and I seen that down fix of what diabetes does to you your body. You didn't want to be that person. I didn't want to be that person. Yeah. So I took care of her for 10 years until she took her last breath. So I went to dialysis Monday, Wednesday, and Friday with her. I seen that she had to get dialysis Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I see how her body changed with the diabetes with her weight loss, with the weight gain, with the water retention. You had to watch your phosphorus. You, your phosphorus make you itch. You mm -hmm. had to watch what you eat, what you intake. And so I just watched how, I mean, when I took care of her, I just seen the You didn't want to be that person? No. no. So um, what was the process leading up to surgery like for you? What did you have to do? Um, the process um, with having the surgery? Yeah. yeah. Um, I had to go to, through the psych. Um, I had to go through many, um, uh, um, talk to different doctors just to see did I want to do it. Um, I had to um, talk to um, um, different um, doctors. They check, uh, they check your blood. Um, they check everything. They make sure you're safe to have Just to make sure you're even safe you to even go under. And so have you had to make changes in your lifestyle after surgery? Yes, you do. What'd you do? Um, I had to change my whole eating habits. All right, so tell us about what you do and don't eat now. Um, I was, what I don't eat is junk. I was eating chips, pop. Oh, they're so good. Um, fried foods, greasy foods, mm -hmm. out to eat. When I do it, either, when I eat out to eat now, I get the kids menu. <laughs> That's impressive. And so when so you're I- you're just eating less food now. Less food, less food. Yeah. And I cut back just from the greasy. Are you continuing to lose weight or have you kind of hit a plateau? Right now, I'm at a plateau, but I'm still losing it. I'm not even trying to lose it no more because yeah. I'm at my goat weight now. That's awesome. So what's the single biggest challenge you faced in all of this? Um, the challenges that I was facing be when I had it, I mean, before I had it, I couldn't get around. Now I can get around, I can walk, I can do more activities. Like when I got here as an employee, I couldn't barely get through my day-to-day -day operation. Like I'm a supervisor, so I have to go on each floor. I have to tell my colleagues, hey, I have to go check on them. Y'all have everything um, just to start your day. Yeah. Some days I couldn't do that. So do they recognize you when you come on the floor still? Yep. Oh, they recognize me. They're like, oh, <laughs> is that Lachey? Is that Lachey? Like this morning. What they, happened to you? They seen me this morning. They was like, oh, my God. We, we, we see the transformation. Yeah. Yes. That's awesome. So um, now you talked about your mom, but we understand that there is another reason you wanted to be healthier. My grandbabies. Oh man, that's My a good baby. reason to be healthy right yes. there, right? That's, that's you gotta right. help raise that. Yes. And, and just congratulations to your beautiful grandbaby and to yes. that family, that's, that's terrific. Yes. And uh, look at that picture. So now, Dr. Mastat McAllister, some people think weight loss surgery is an easy out, but we really know that that's not true but they don't realize how challenging it can be. Talk to us a little bit about that. Well, yeah, and I think Lachey has pointed that out beautifully, that you know the operations are an important tool, but it's not the easy way out, yeah. and it is a lot of hard work and dedication. And Lachey and I were talking earlier about her morning walking and exercise yes. routine, and so the surgeries are important tools to get patients going in the right track, Correct. but similar to bariatric surgery, the GLP-1s, any of the medications, nutrition and lifestyle interventions are a key component of all of it. It's obesity is a difficult to treat disease, and it takes a lot of work and multiple different treatment arms. Correct. So Lachey has had gastric bypass, but there are different kinds of weight loss surgery. Talk to us a little bit about how do you know which one is right for which patient? You, you mentioned a few of them earlier, but kind of go through that with us a little bit. You know, it's a great question because there's not necessarily one operation that's right for every single patient. It's really each individual patient's health right. history and risk factors. Mm -hmm. And so a patient who has diabetes, we may discuss with them more operations Correct. that involve a bypass, such as the ruin y gastric bypass or the biliopancreatic diversion with duodenal switch. Those are all big words there. But there it's we know they're different words, surgeries. Yeah. And so, yeah, 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 yeah. They are. We tend to abbreviate because that's a, a mouthful. Yeah. It it's, just falls out of your mouth. It does, like yeah. It's normal stuff. And you know, the study we're discussing also shows that a sleeve gastrectomy is a very effective treatment for diabetes, not quite as effective as what mm -hmm. we see with some of the bypass procedures. So have the numbers of patients requiring that dropped off because of drugs like Wagovi and Zepbound, Ozempic and all those? 
Yes, I think we're certainly seeing a decrease in, yeah. in surgery referrals. And, and part of that, you know, it's a good thing. We need additional treatment arms. Right. But what we know historically is that less than 1% of patients who qualify for bariatric surgery ever had bariatric surgery. So hopefully with the popularity of this medications, it's, it's bringing more people to the conversation you and the bet. topic. Hopefully it's making all physicians more comfortable in discussing weight with their well, patients, which has been a difficult thing do, in the past. Yeah, medically, and, and my guess is that there's gonna be plenty of room for both, uh, you know, uh, of, their, of both these different things. And is this all covered by insurance? Majority of insurance do cover the bariatric operations. There are some exceptions, and then similar with the anti-obesity medications. And, and John, when, when people do this kind of surgery and have the success Lachey has, pretty typically their lives are transformed, their diabetes is under better control. Is that the normal outcome, or is Lachey the exception? It's the normal outcome. I mean, the data is profound, and it changes from surgical site to surgical site, but, but, but overall, there's you know, significant weight loss and significant weight loss maintenance over time, which is really the hard part with typical caloric restriction induced weight loss is yeah. the weight cycling. Um, so yeah, it's, it's pretty typical data. Yeah, it's pretty impressive data. Congratulations. So, <laughs> but we're gonna have some questions. We're gonna be here to answer your questions in just a moment. Send them in to the links on your screen, YouTube, Facebook, or email the Medical News Network. Hey, let's check in with DocCon. He and I are still having questions about avian flu. And that patient or patients in Missouri. Hawkeye, you were on the program not too long ago. You and I were having this conversation. We're like, yeah, they got one person who had avian flu. Mm -hmm. It's not, the others just had symptoms, which could have been yeah. the common cold, Hawk. Yeah, I think that's right. You know, um, we have this patient in Missouri, again, was seen in October, went to the hospital for a certain reason. We don't know what that reason was, but under some routine surveillance, they did testing for influenza, came back as influenza A. Further typing of that was H5N1, avian influenza. The real concern is here, there wasn't any contact or known exposure to animals, which all the other cases, even the recent cases in California, Steve, have been had <coughs> recent contact with dairy cows. So there is very little concrete information about this patient. Again, the patient was ultimately sent home and was doing well, but we should understand um, what we don't know and that hasn't been reported to the public yet. What we still don't know is why was uh, the patient with bird flu hospitalized? Like I said, the current information says that they were hospitalized for an undisclosed reason, something related to their underlying medical illness. Also, what were uh, the symptoms of that patient and why were they tested? It might just have been some routine uh, symptoms. Maybe they did have respiratory symptoms. But then we now have, uh, as they went back and looked, uh, they did understand that the patient did test positive for H5N1 after the patient left the hospital. Uh, now they did an investigation and found that around that patient who possibly uh, had exposure were healthcare workers. They did then retrospectively report uh, symptoms after that patient left the hospital during the investigation. Those symptoms were respiratory in nature. One of the patients actually had symptoms during that time and was tested and was negative for influenza. That was by PCR. The other several patients now, unfortunately it's too late, so we'll have to look at antibodies to see if that patient, those patients who uh, reported respiratory symptoms uh, truly had uh, any uh, infection such as H5N1. Unfortunately, that antibody test is going to take time. We won't know probably for another week or so because they are creating a special specific antibody test so they can make sure that they identify only H5N1 if those patients were uh, exposed to H5N1. Um, and then, so what was the timing? That is very important. What were their symptoms? As we know from the anecdotal reports and some of the reports that have been reported in the human H5N1 infections in the United States, a lot of those people had conjunctivitis, so eye symptoms. They didn't really have respiratory symptoms, so it is unclear exactly why um, and what these other healthcare workers that were exposed and had symptoms had. Again, and we talked about this, there was another little virus that was circulating at the time, SARS-CoV-2, and so that had high circulation at the time, was it COVID-19 that those patients had? It's really uh, hard to say. Hopefully we'll get some more information about that. We know that the dairy workers in California, again, all of those patients had exposure to animals. This patient in Missouri did not. And so we are still trying to ask those questions, do those investigations to get the 
uh, the most important information. And what I would say too is that um, per World Health Organization WHO uh, information, you know, the case fatality of rate of people who have had H5N1 around the world uh, since 2003 is around 50%. Certainly we haven't seen that here in the United States. However, I would say that those patients that did seem to have respiratory symptoms, those healthcare workers that we are investigating to see if it was H5N1, they all seemingly did well without any treatment or antiviral. Uh, I'm skeptical that this was actually H5N1 in those exposed healthcare workers, but we do need to ask the questions. We need, do need to get the data, and when we do get it, we will certainly report back uh, to you. So on a related note, the FDA Vaccine Advisory Group, or VRBAC, I think mm -hmm. that's right, something like that, meets tomorrow, and part of the meeting will be to discuss some of the H5 vaccines. Thoughts about how that's gonna go? Yeah, I think it's important to understand that this current circulating H5N1 clade or viral strain um, is not the exact strain that was used for the current stockpiled H5N1. So I think they're gonna discuss that and maybe tweak the recommendations on creating a new H5N1 vaccine that we can give to uh, humans. Um, so we'll see what they do discuss. And then how easy is it going to be able to ramp up production of that? How soon will it be available? Will we even need it? What will the recommendations be? So I think there are a lot of questions there, but I think one of the major questions is, do we need to then now create um, a more, uh, uh, specific vaccine for this current circulating clade uh, or viral uh, variant that is circulating through the dairy herds and poultry in America at this point in time. All right, thank you, sir. Yeah. We know many of you have questions. Let's head to Studio B with Alexis. Alexis Del Cid, how are you? Good morning, you? doing well. Where's the, we blue? Have... Where's the blue? You got red on well, today. I'm still celebrating the Chiefs win. I'll, okay. I'll bust out the blue tomorrow. All right, well, we got you know, I got a little blue here in the office that I can always show. Yes, that's right. I got my blue Royals tie, I got my blue shirt, and I got my little couple of blue pins on. So, you know, I'm blue. You're well, then check out Lachey next to you. She looks amazing I, I'm in her saying, blue that's, Now, that's even better, suit. no question about it. I, I could break beautiful. out into singing. Okay. Sing, you know, I could sing about some royal songs or something like that if you want me to. <laughs> oh, song, song, blue, everybody knows one. <laughs> Shall I get to the questions, or do you want to keep singing? No, you should. Probably uh, I'll get to the questions question. before this deteriorates any further. All right, Yen Liang has a question, and he has a couple questions in one. So I'm going to summarize. He wants to know if bariatric surgery can impair the absorption of vitamin B12, and could the reduction in gastrointestinal nutrient absorb absorption because of surgery pose a risk for a woman who wants to become pregnant or All her right. baby? Good question. Yeah, Who's taking that one on, team? I'd be happy to. Yes. So, All right. um, yes, correct. The bariatric operations can change or affect how we absorb various micronutrients, and, and vitamin B12 is a prime example. Mm -hmm. And so with these operations, patients do have to be diligent about continuing on a vitamin regimen after surgery. You know, hopefully we're prescribing some new vitamins and getting rid of some of their prescription medications, such as diabetes medications. Um, but it does require patients to adhere to vitamin supplements, and so B12 can be taken by by mouth, under the tongue, sometimes an injection in the muscle. In regards to pregnancy, yes, it is safe to become pregnant after bariatric operations. We advise and recommend that patients wait really a minimum of at least one year, and ideally you want weight to be stabilized um, prior to patients conceiving. So certainly a great question. Important thing after bariatric surgery too is, is that it can significantly improve infertility in women who previously couldn't conceive. And so that's something that we always have to, to caution of during that wow. weight loss process. You can actually become pregnant now. Yeah. Well, there you go. Jean Raritan has a question for Dr. McAllister. Jean would, would like it if you could define what is bariatric surgery? What are you doing in there? Oh, sure. So bariatric surgery, there are a variety of operations that we perform. In the United States, the most commonly performed operations are the, the sleeve gastrectomy, the Roux-en-Y gastric bypass, and the biliopancreatic diversion with duodenal switch. With the sleeve gastrectomy... Can we just talk about that one? Because that was sure. really it's complicated. It's a lot, yes. <laughs> Yeah, it's a big word. Yeah. With the sleeve gastrectomy... I like that duodenal sort of switch <laughs> thing. That's, that's interesting. <laughs> uh, with the sleeve gastrectomy, we essentially remove approximately 75 to 80 percent of the stomach, so the remaining stomach really ends up looking like a long, skinny banana. And so it also, you can't take in as much, but we see, again, 
more increase in the, the stomach emptying enhanced nutrient sensing. With the gastric bypass, it's a, a smaller stomach pouch, and then we actually bypass part of the small intestine and bring that up to the pouch. And the BPD, really kind of a combination of those two with a sleeve and more aggressive bypass. So lots of different types of things to do in the surgical team with the, the, the patients. Sit down, talk about those options, pick the right one. Yeah, Which one did you have? I had the um, Ruin. Ruin Y. The Ruin yeah. Y. Okay, yes, so it's a little bigger deal though. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Lachey, Jeremy Yenser has a question for you. He wants to know if you had to make any adjustments in the ways that you exercise post-surgery. Well, you can probably exercise. Oh, uh, at first, I couldn't, but now I can do, I can do everything. <laughs> Lift weights, I can run, I can jump, I can do everything. That's pretty awesome. So no limitations. No limitations. In what you can do, that's fantastic. No and Jill has a question. She wants to know, was the surgery itself difficult? Was it hard to recover from it? How quickly were you back to normal? Um, it wasn't hard to recover. The pain, oh. It was it was <laughs> enormous, but after I think after the first after the second day, I was able to get up and move around. But you have to get up and move. That's the key. You got to move around because you can't just lay, because you would be it. You would be stiff. We'll put you on a poster and have you say that to everybody who walks in here. You, <laughs> you got to get up and move. Yes. Yep. No matter what your and disease let me is, tell you, you got to get up. And they move. will make you get up and move. <laughs> yeah. We've heard so many patients say that post any kind of surgery. The surgeon comes in and says, all right, time to get up. You're gonna do some laps around the hospital. Yes. L yep. Lachey, I have a quick question for you. Are there any foods that you can't tolerate anymore? Um, beef, ground beef. Interesting. Can't do it. What happens if you have ground beef? Oh, baby. <laughs> you will go You have a baby? The, oh, no, oh, baby, you will go. It will, it will, tell, it will wake you up. It, wow. You will either throw up or you will go to the restroom. To go. Uh, why is that? Well, you know, we'll see a variety of different food intolerances after the operations. Yes. You know, that first year, although a year seems like a long time period, that's really early in the lifespan of these operations. And so early on, foods may be difficult that later patients are able to resume again. Some patients do have certain food triggers that just don't sit well with them. But for the majority of the time, patients can adapt and then get back to a full variety of foods and then those healthy food options as well. That is pretty amazing. And did you say, did you get to stop taking your diabetes drugs? I don't take no more yeah. diabetes. Amazing. That's awesome. Well, this has been a great discussion. I'm grateful to our guests for being here. I want to hear some final thoughts before we go. Lachey, final thought. Um, if anybody does want to get the gastric bop, I mean, get the surgery, I'll say go for it. All right, I like that. It's like she's an ad for you there, Dr. McAllister. Yeah, I think she said everything I need to say. This is the best part of the job, seeing how patients have a new lease on life, the activities they're able to do with their family, friends, children, grandchildren. It's really, it's the best part of the, that of the job. That is awesome. Dr. Tifo. I'd like to just say we, we need to destigmatize obesity treatment and get more people coming to the table to either try the new drugs, um, lifestyle interventions, or surgery. And it just needs to be talked about more. People don't need to be living with these conditions and putting themselves at risk long term for all is, these is, health outcomes. And isn't it fair to say obesity is not a choice, it's, it's a not disease. A choice. It's a disease, That's very great. clear. And uh, some of what our fast food industry and others reinforce with the images they project and mm -hmm. and, and in our modern ways. environment it's yeah. it's hard to not gain weight in our modern environment it's yeah. very difficult we don't have to run out and hunt and forage right yeah. and going to whole foods is not the same going to the grocery store or going to costco <laughs> right, not the right. same thing dr hawkeye this is a pretty big story yeah no i think it is i think there we are always in we have been asked you know how do i stay healthy there are multiple components certainly nutrition Weight loss is good, keeping a handle on, on your weight, uh, keeping a handle on what you eat, eating those healthy foods as we just heard. Uh, you know, the fast foods are very difficult, but in our modern age, it is difficult to get those healthy foods. The other things, uh, it is multifactorial for overall health. Sleep, we talked about sleep, exercise, being active. Certainly, we know that the uh, foundations, the pillars of infection prevention hand washing is extremely important and vaccines so it is multifactorial on how to live a healthy life uh, we see Lachey is doing this and that's good um, and we just want to encourage everybody to try and be able to do that we understand access to health care is always difficult we have health care providers to help um, but please it is multifactorial and we are here to help uh, you 
do that and achieve your goals as well. You know, the journey to a better life is a highly personal one. It could take a team, but ultimately, it's what Lachey said. First, you have to make the decision to do it. Then, you gotta get up, you gotta rock and roll, you gotta move. And when you do that with a great team, you can accomplish a lot of things, including being able to get up, lift weights, and do everything you want and get off those diabetic meds. That's awesome. Thanks again to our guests. Thanks to our audience. Remember, together, with faith, hope, and science, we can do almost anything. And tonight, we're even going to do something else. We're going to beat the Yankees. We'll see you soon. Subscribe to our Morning Medical Update and Open Mics with Dr. Stites podcast. Now, everywhere podcasts are available.